Hi everybody. Uh, today we are starting our central nervous system lecture and we're going to start by looking at the central nervous system anatomy and then we'll dive into more of the physiological aspect of the uh, nervous system. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so when we're talking about your uh, central nervous system, uh, we know it's broken down to uh, your brain and your spinal cord. And uh, Today, focus is only going to be on brain, and then we'll expand on that later on uh, in terms of the spinal cord. Uh, so your brain is actually broken down to um, four major structures, and each of those may have uh, substructures within them as well. Uh, so starting with your um, cerebrum. Uh, cerebrum is what's depicted in yellow in this picture. Uh, this is the largest part of your brain. Uh, it, it, is responsible for many of the activities in terms of uh, receiving sensory data, uh, integrating that data, making sense of that, and also voluntary control of your skeletal muscle or voluntary muscle movement and uh, in, uh Inferior to your cerebrum, in the posterior aspect of your brain, you have your cerebellum depicted in orange here. Uh, we'll go more into details about the function. Uh, we'll talk about some of the function briefly. Um, so please keep in mind that even though I have listed a number of functions for each of these uh, structures, uh, there is much more going on in the brain than what is covered here. Now at the core of your brain, uh, uh, hidden by the cerebrum, you have this uh, structure depicted in purple, uh, referred to as the diencephalon. Uh, diencephalon has three major parts, uh, thalamus and hypothalamus that are labeled here, thalamus and hypothalamus. And then you also have um, another structure called epithalamus. Uh, we won't go into too much detail about that, uh, but I will briefly mention it later on. Um, I do want you guys to note that coming off of the hypothalamus, you have this small gland um, that is the part of it is the extension of the hypothalamus and the other part is a separate gland. Uh, as a whole, it is referred to as the pituitary gland, uh, which is broken down to the anterior pituitary and the posterior pituitary gland. Now you'll learn a lot more about the uh, gland uh, when you talk about the endocrine system later on. And coming off of your brain, you have what we identify as your brain stem uh, depicted in green color. Brain itself, its brain stem itself has three parts. Um, one right inferior to the diencephalon is your midbrain. The bulging part is pons, and then that continues to become medulla oblongata. If you continue medulla oblongata, uh, that actually becomes your spinal cord. Uh, which is, again, continuation of your central nervous system. So when we're talking about brain development, um, we're talking about embryonic as well as an adult brain growth. Um, so in an embryo, the brain actually starts as a structure called neural tube, which is basically a collection of the cell bodies that it starts to extend their extensions, uh, which are the dendrites and the axon. Uh, so the interesting fact is that within a very short period of time, which is the first four weeks of embryonic development, uh, you go from a single neural tube to a, a much more visible structure and pronounced structure called primary brain vesicles. And from that, uh, within a week of that, so by week five, you form what we identify as secondary brain vesicles. So you notice that the development of the brain is much more rapid than the rest of the structures that may take longer. However, at the same time, brain also needs a significant amount of time to develop, uh, which basically means that it requires a whole uh, time of pregnancy to fully develop and be functional. And eventually we work our way toward the adult brain, which is uh, basically uh, a brain that has all of the uh, main structures. So here's a depiction of what your brain looks like from embryonic uh, all the way to an adult brain. So we start with again, what we identify as a, um, a neural tube. Um, you have the view in terms of anterior versus posterior, also known as Rostal and Kojo. 
Primary brain vesicles that are developing within the first four weeks of embryonic development form three major structures. And these are uh, from anterior to posterior or prosencephalon, also known as forebrain, mesencephalon, also known as midbrain, and rhomboencephalon, also known as hindbrain. Within a week, the brain has significantly developed to its secondary brain vesicles. So prosencephalon, which was identified as the forebrain, is now developed to what we identify as telencephalon and diencephalon. And eventually these two structures will form your cerebrum, which was the largest part of your brain. Uh, that includes your cerebral hemisphere, the cortex, as well as the white matter as well as what we identify as basal ganglia. We already talked about diencephalon. Diencephalon is made up of your thalamus, hypothalamus, and epithalamus. Uh, mesencephalon, which was your midbrain in the primary brain vesicle, is still continues to become mesencephalon, and that, as the name implies, will continue to become midbrain uh, in an adult brain. Rhomboencephalon, which is the most caudal aspect of the brain, uh, will eventually form to two parts, metencephalon and myeloencephalon. Uh, metencephalon uh, develops to your pons portion of the brain stem and the cerebellum, uh, the most caudal part of the brain. And then the myeloencephalon eventually forms into uh, the most inferior part of your brain, uh, which is your medulla oblongata. And as we already know, medulla oblongata continues to become your spinal cord. I do want to note a quick note for you guys. Uh, the last part of this table is something called um, ventricles or brain canals. We'll talk about this in more detail, but to just kind of introduce the topic right now, uh, we have something called um, cerebrospinal fluid or CSF. Uh, CSF uh, flows around the brain and within the brain and the spinal cord. So if it is within the brain, you can find this fluid, cerebrospinal fluid or CSF, within lateral ventricle, third ventricle, cerebral aqueduct, and fourth ventricle. And if you're talking about the spinal cord, you can find the fluid inside of the spinal cord at a structure called central canal. Now, as we go through this, I will identify this on a more detailed picture of the brain. Now, we already talked about this. This is kind of the review of what I told you guys in picture. Uh, the only thing that is not described here, um, if you are going to add it, is the concept of or the component epithalamus, which is not listed here. Now, before we get this started, I want you guys to be able to distinguish what we identify as gray matter versus white matter. So gray matter is what we identify as short, non-myelinated neurons and cell bodies. So if you have a part of the brain that appears as a darker color, uh, that is what gray matter is. And if it has more of a, a I guess lighter color, that would be your white matter. Now, any cell body that you will see in your brain uh, that is clustered together, we're not talking about individual neurons. So if you have quite a few of the cell bodies together, uh, then they will have a grayish appearance. Um, if you have clusters of non-myelinated axons uh, or neurons uh, within a region of the brain, they will also appear as gray matter. Now, if you guys recall from your intro to nervous system lecture, uh, we also talked about what we identified as myelin sheath, uh, which is surrounding your axon. So because of that myelin sheath, because it's mostly fatty tissue, that basically the plasma membrane that wraps around it, wrap itself around the axon, uh, the color is kind of um, yellowish um, uh, or kind of a shade of a white. Uh, so we refer to this as white matter. Uh, the, um, there is a distinction, and I'll show you guys this in, on a picture um, in just a second, uh, but um, basically you will see a distinction in your brain tissue when you compare uh, gray matter versus white matter. Uh, now, 
when we're talking about cerebrum, which is the largest part of your brain, uh, we have um, cerebral hemisphere, which is the t literally breaking down the cerebrum to two halves. And um, in cerebrum, the, uh, and cerebellum also, uh, the, the gray matter um, is referred to as the cortex, or more specifically, cerebral cortex. Uh, the brain stem also has additional gray matters that are very uh, specific and very visible when you're doing a gross anatomy of the brain. Uh, so those gray matters are referred to as nuclei uh, and they are scattered throughout the white matter. And again, it is relatively easily, easily visualized when you are taking a look at the gross anatomy of the brain. So let me just kind of show you what I mean by the gray matter versus white matter. Uh, the cut that you're seeing right here, that's a coronal cut of the cerebrum. Uh, so again, you can kind of see the edges of your brain um, uh, have this kind of a darker color to it. Those are the, uh, the cell bodies of majority of the neurons uh, and they're identified as uh, cerebral cortex. And again, cerebral cortex is the gray matter of your cerebrum. Uh, the areas right underneath this, which is a good a space within the cerebrum, and those are called white matter. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, in terms of brain stem, but you also have this in uh, your cerebrum, uh, you have what we call nuclei, which is gray matter that are um, localized within the white matter. Um, so they are literally, if this is a sea of white matter, you have the spots of gray matter throughout that, and that's called the um, brain nuclei. Now, when we're talking about the central nervous system, uh, that include, again, both the spinal cord and your skull, uh, we must protect it. And the best way for your um, body to provide protection is or one of the ways that it can provide protection is by providing three protective layers around your brain and a spinal cord, which are known as meninges. Now, meninges are broken down to, from outer to inner, dura matter, arachnoid matter, and pia matter. So let's take a look at each of these and look at some of their characteristics. Um, again, uh, central, um, sorry, cerebrospinal fluid or CSF that I mentioned earlier is also associated with your meninges. So, dura matter, which is the outermost lining of your meninges, is the one that basically comes in or closest to your skull. Um, it is itself consists of two layer. Um, there are very fibrous layer, which means there is a lot of protein fibers with the goal of protection. Uh, there is a gap between the inner and the outer fibrous matter um, or layer of dura matter called dural sinus. Dural sinus is extremely important because it does contain blood vessels that eventually uh, drain into the jugular vein. So basically, they're the ones that co collect a significant amount of deoxygenated blood from your uh, brain and return them back to the heart for the purpose of oxygenation. So let me show you the dura matter in, in a picture. Uh, so right here, you have your um, cranium, and which is basically your skull, and uh, this is your dura matter uh, that we are depicting here. Uh, so um, this is the outer membrane, um, and this is the inner membrane, and what you see as the blue color in between that, that's your dural sinus, basically the area where all of the blood vessels uh, collect uh, deoxygenated blood from your brain. Now, the second layer we have is called the arachnoid matter, and this is the middle layer. So let me show you on a picture. Uh, so arachnoid matter is this layer you see right here, from here to here. Um, arachnoid matter um, has what we call a subarachnoid space. And the subarachnoid space is uh, where we would have um, 
sorry, uh, cerebrospinal, uh, subarachnoid sub space is where we would have the cerebrospinal fluid or CSF flowing inside. So that gap is basically very close to your brain and is essential for providing that kind of buoyancy and a, a layer of fluid around the brain for protection, which is your CSF again. You also have um, the innermost lining of the brain. This is a very thin layer. It's very glossy looking and it's, uh, it sticks literally to the surface of the brain. And um, that layer is um, uh, where you basically call pia matter. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, basically the space you will have uh, between your arachnoid matter and uh, your pia matter that gap that you see right there, uh, that's called the subarachnoid space, uh, which is where you will have your CSF or your cerebrospinal fluid uh, collected at. So let's take a look at what is cerebrospinal fluid. Cerebrospinal fluid is the fluid that found around both the brain and the spinal cord. The main function of this would be to provide protection and cushioning for your nervous system. So the way I always describe this is think about you have a can and you have a ball inside of that. Um, if the can is empty, when you shake the can, uh, the ball really bounces off inside the can. And if you fill the can with some sort of fluid um, and then place the ball inside of it, then Though ball moves inside, it's not going to be, uh, the movement are going to be uh, significantly less and more fluid. Uh, so it doesn't hit the sides of the can as hard as it uh, would have been if there was no fluid. Uh, so same concept applies if you're thinking about your brain, uh, having that CSF around it versus not having the CSF around it. That being said, just because you have this fluid and that fluid provides buoyancy and protection for the brain, that doesn't mean that uh, the brain cannot be damaged uh, if the force or trauma is significant. The brain will still bounce off the side of the skull. It will still cause bruising and in some cases, rupturing of the blood vessels. And we'll look at that in later, in later, in more detail as well. Uh, cerebrospinal fluid also has a second function as it provides nutrients and chemicals for the brain tissue. Now, what produces your cerebrospinal fluid is a structure called choroid plexus. Uh, choroid plexus is highly vascularized uh, and this area basically associates with your ventricle and produces this uh, CSF directly from your bloodstream. So choroid plexus have these cells called ependymal cells and the job of these ependymal cells is to basically control the flow of the CSF uh, through the uh, ventricles and the cavities of the brain. So ependymal cells have these little extensions called cilia and um, they allow the CSF to continue staying in, the motion, in motion and basically allow the flow to happen. Now, when I talk about CSF, a lot of people think about, oh, this is going to be a lot of fluid and uh, that, that's going to basically be something that's um, pretty large volume. Um, in reality, and the CSF is pretty uh, small in terms of volume. It's about 150 milliliters. Um, so, the really interesting fact about it is that this fluid is being recycled every eight hours. So um, you really want to be careful with your brain tissue in terms of uh, what surrounds your brain. So this, this fluid is highly monitored and basically, again, as I mentioned, recycled every eight hours. Here is a depiction of what I meant in terms of choroid plexus. This is a... a uh, capillary network that passes through the choroid plexus. These are our ependymal cells with their cilia that are those finger-like extensions. Your ependymal cells basically uh, responsible for taking whatever you need from the bloodstream. That includes water, glucose, oxygen, and certain ions and bring it into the CSF. 
and then um, anything your body doesn't need uh, or it's considered waste product for your brain uh, then gets absorbed by your sorry absorbed through your ependymal cell and back into the capillary bed for recycling this is a really cool structure and again uh, directly connected to your ventricles uh, where the csf uh, is uh, flowing inside your brain now where can we find the csf so we already kind of mentioned a couple but now we're going to put them in a very specific location we already talked about subarachnoid space uh, which is the space between um, the arachnoid layer and pia matter or arachnoid matter and pia matter uh, you have your main ventricles i mentioned them before uh, they're known as uh, lateral ventricle uh, third ventricle cerebral aqueduct and fourth ventricle and the, the cavity that runs at the center of the spinal cord called central canal and you'll you'll see them in just a second in more detail so ventricles if you take a look at them uh, these are these uh, paired membrane um, or i guess a uh, paired uh, structures both in the left and right side of your brain uh, they are separated from each other by a membrane called septum pellucidum. And I want to just kind of help you visualize this. These are structures you see like kind of like horns, and these are your lateral ventricles. This view, if you haven't figured it out, this is when you look at the brain from the front. So that's the anterior view, and this is your lateral view. So what we see here as this kind of the shoe, shoe horse structure, the U shape, and this is a different view of that. Those are both your lateral ventricle and right at the center where you have that kind of separation, that's your septum pellucidum. Uh, third ventricle is connected to your lateral ventricle uh, by a structure called interventricular foramen. And again, third ventricle location-wise uh, would be where your thalamus is. So this is where your thalamus will be sitting. Um, here is an anterior view. You won't be able to see much of it, but from the lateral view, we can see it is a relatively good size of structure. Um, going down from the third ventricle, the fluid gets picked up by this kind of a tube-like structure going down, uh, which is visualized here, and that's called the cerebral aqueduct. And then cerebral aqueduct ends with a structure connected to cerebellum uh, or associated cerebellum and your brain stem, and that's known as your fourth ventricle. Uh, please do note that the fourth ventricle, which is right here, continues to go down the spinal cord, as you can see here, through the central canal of the spinal cord. <clears throat> so those are the four um, main structures. Um, and again, uh, we have uh, the fluid also flowing inside uh, the um, subarachnoid space. Um, the way they are connected to the subarachnoid space is through the fourth ventricle, if you were wondering. Now, let's look at some of the vocabularies associated with cerebrum. Um, so cerebrum, as we learned, is the largest part of your brain. Um, and if you think and look at this, this is 87, sorry, 83% of your brain mass is considered to be cerebrum, which is a huge part of your brain. Uh, it does major functions in your brain, including receiving data, integration, which is basically making sense of the data, and eventually communicating with uh, a skeletal muscle for voluntary control. Please do keep in mind, again, these are skeletal muscles. Uh, which means the movement will be voluntary. Now, there are specific patterns and structures on the surface of your cerebrum. So if, these, if you see ridges on the surface, which is basically the pattern you see on the surface of the brain, they're called gyri. If you're talking about one single ridge on the surface of the brain, they're called gyrus, with a U-S at the end. The shallow grooves that actually create the ridges of the brain are called sulci, if we're talking about multiple, and sulcus, if we're talking about only one. Now, if the sulcus is really deep, we refer to those as fissures. Um, we have a couple of main fissures associated with your cerebrum. 
Uh, one is called the longitudinal fissure, uh, which literally divides the brain to the right and left hemispheres. Uh, so cutting the brain right at the center. And then we have what we identified as a transverse cerebral fissure, which is separating the cerebrum from the cerebellum. That's the more posterior aspect of your brain. Kind of helping you visualize this uh, right here. Again, these kind of bumps or ridges on the surface of your brain are called gyrus. If we talk about one and gyri, if we're talking about multiple, uh, the, the lines that you see, if they're not too deep, uh, that's called the sulcus. And if the sulcus is deep and it's actually causing a visible separation of the brain parts, uh, that is referred to as a fissure. So fissure are literally deep sulci. I also want you guys to note uh, the gray matter again, which we identified as a cerebral cortex and the white matter right underneath that. Uh, this picture depicts the main uh, separation between the right and left hemisphere using what we identified as the longitudinal fissure. So here is your longitudinal fissure. You have the front or anterior part of the brain, the posterior part of the brain. And I'll take a look at the uh, lobes of the brain in just a minute as well. Uh, but again, by using the longitudinal fissure, you're creating a right cerebral hemisphere and left cerebral hemisphere. Now, one of the last thing I wanna to talk to you guys for this lecture is uh, the five major segmentations or lobes of the cerebrum. Uh, so if you guys recall um, from your skull, or if you ever looked at the bones of the skull or cranium, uh, we have four major bones that forms the cranium. Uh, they are the frontal bone, which is a single bone, and then occipital bone, which is also a single bone. And then you have paired identical bones called parietal bones that forms the top of your cranium and temporal bone that forms the, the paired temporal bones that forms the side of your cranium. So when it comes to naming the lobes of the brain, we name them based on the bones that are covering or protecting that part of the brain. Now it is not identical, so the frontal bone does not end at the same exact location that the frontal lobe ends, uh, but it kind of gives you a really good idea as far as the naming of the structures. Uh, so right here in red, we have the frontal lobe. Going toward more toward the back, you have the parietal lobe. Uh, the most posterior or rostral aspect of the brain, you have the occipital lobe. And dark blue color, we have our temporal lobe. Please do note that you can actually move the frontal lobe and separate it from the temporal lobe. And what you will see is additional gyri and sulci underneath that, which is another part of the cerebrum called insula. So even though insula is not visible on this view, it does have quite a few functions associated with your brain. Now, this I wanna talk about and then we'll finish up for this lecture. So cerebral hemisphere has very specific marking that helps you divide it. So two of the main divisions you will see on your cerebral hemispheres, uh, they are called central sulcus and lateral sulcus. So if you take your frontal lobe and your parietal lobe, there is a separation line between those two and that line is referred to as the central sulcus. So, here is my frontal lobe here, here is my parietal lobe, and this line right in between those, that's your central sulcus. You have another line that is separating or outlines your temporal bone and separates it from the parietal and the frontal lobe, and that's called the lateral sulcus. And this is the line you see right here, again, lateral sulcus. Now, one quick note on this. There is immediate gyri in front of the central sulcus and one gyrus right after the central sulcus. The one right immediately in front, or I should say 
before the central sulcus is referred to as the precentral gyrus, as in pre means before. You have the, the gyrus that sits after the central sulcus, after we use the word post, so that's post central gyrus. So precentral gyrus and post central gyrus. If you are wondering why we're separating them based on gyri rather than lobes, um, the main reason is that there is a very particular function associated with both the uh, precentral gyrus as well as the postcentral gyrus. So we're going to distinguish them in terms of function. Okay, so I'm going to stop the lecture here and we'll uh, start uh, discussing cerebral cortex, both in terms of a structure and function in more detail in part two of the central nervous system.